The Australian Radiation Protection Nuclear Safety Agency, APANSA, is the government agency which sets the safety standard for human exposure to wireless radiation. APANSA has published new advice, updated in June 2013, to help reduce children's exposure to wireless radiation. Their fact sheet 14 states, Due to the lack of scientific evidence on mobile and cordless phone use by children, APANSA recommends that parents encourage their children to limit their exposure. Many other household wireless devices use radio frequency electromagnetic energy to communicate, including wireless computer networks. Currently, standards are only based on thermal effects. This protects humans against heating injury in a short period of time, like a microwave oven. However, APANSA's previous fact sheet 13 states, Some research has indicated that non-thermal effects resulting from low-level RF exposure may also occur. However, the existence of these effects and their implications has not been sufficiently established to allow for them in the standard. Because the current safety standards do not account for any long-term biological effects from prolonged low-level exposure, we should be taking APANSA's practical advice to reduce exposure to children. Scientists know that wireless radiation from mobile phones penetrates the human body. Children are also more vulnerable since they have thinner skulls and the developing cells will have a longer lifetime of exposure than adults today. APANSA acknowledges that The technology is very new and it is impossible to be completely sure there isn't some risk. This is particularly true for children where there is little research evidence. So, if you're concerned about mobile phones, what about Wi-Fi and the wireless radiation emitted from these devices? Wi-Fi uses similar frequencies as mobile phones. Let's compare the radiation emitted by these different wireless devices. The official SAR values are measurements of the rate at which radio frequency, electromagnetic energy, is absorbed by the human body from mobile and wireless devices. These SAR values are based on a short six-minute average temperature measurement of a liquid-filled model of an adult male-sized head. The SAR value of the iPad on Wi-Fi is higher than most phones, and the higher the value, the more RFEM energy is absorbed by the human body. In a real-life test, an iPhone and an iPad were measured using an RF EMR meter. First, the iPhone. A call was put through and the measurement was taken on talk mode. The meter peaked at 19 with a continuous signal for the duration of the call. Let's compare this to an iPad using Wi-Fi. In this video, the Wi-Fi is turned on, but it's not downloading anything or surfing the internet. Even so, the iPad peaks at 70, which is over three times higher than the iPhone on talk mode. This signal is intermittent and spikes every few seconds for as long as the Wi-Fi is on. So how much time do we spend using these Wi-Fi enabled tablets? It's likely to be a lot longer than the time spent talking on the phone. If you're playing games or surfing the internet, it could possibly be for hours every day. Let's take the iPad apart and look to see where the antenna is located. It may surprise you to know that there are in fact five antennas inside an iPad. The Wi-Fi antennas are located in the section behind the button and behind the Apple sign at the back. This is where the wireless radiation is the most powerful. So how do kids use these tablets? Let's just review this. An iPad using Wi-Fi puts out pulses of wireless radiation at peak levels higher than an iPhone on talk mode. It does this even when you aren't surfing the internet. The official SAR value for an iPad is higher than most phones. The antennas are in places that can be in contact with the body, including reproductive organs. At present, scientists have no idea what will happen when exposures will last for a lifetime. Yet schools are introducing tablets and other Wi-Fi enabled devices to children at an increasingly earlier age. Mobile apps for school children have also been produced by education departments. Is this what we want our children to be exposed to for extended periods of time? At home, parents can follow Apanza's advice and take steps to reduce exposure. At school, however, parents and children are not being given a choice and children are being exposed involuntarily. APANSA states that APANSA does not regulate policy in the education department. 
it is up to schools to apply the precautionary minimization requirement in the APANSA standard as they see fit. The education departments say they are within APANSA standards, yet keep in mind these standards only protect against short-term heating injury measured using a liquid-filled model. So who exactly is taking responsibility to protect children's long-term health which may be affected from prolonged low-level exposure to wireless technologies? Technologies that are currently being promoted and mandated in schools. In 2011, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer classified all radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic to humans. All radio frequency wireless technologies are now considered as a possible cancer causing agent and not just mobile phones. This is the same category as lead, DDT, exhaust fumes and chloroform. So the standards only account for short term heating injury. Schools say they are compliant with this standard. APANSA acknowledges that non-thermal effects may occur and they have issued advice on how to reduce exposure. However, APANSA says they don't regulate policy for Wi-Fi use in schools. The World Health Organization has classified all radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic to humans. But the standards only account for short-term heating injury and schools say they are compliant with this standard. In line with this classification and the advice in APANSA's Fact Sheet 14, shouldn't schools be taking steps to protect children's long-term health? Other countries have issued similar advice such as Canada, the UK and France. The French National Assembly voted in March 2013 to use hardwired connections in schools and not Wi-Fi. The Council of Europe have called for a ban on Wi-Fi use in schools and urge governments to inform the public about the risks so that people can use these technologies safely. The German government recommends against the installation of Wi-Fi in schools and the Russian National Committee on Non-Ionising Radiation, which is equivalent to a Panza, warns against the use of wireless communications in schools. A Panza's Fact Sheet 14 says the most effective way to reduce the exposure is to increase the distance between your mobile phone and your head or body. You can do this by using a wide earpiece, microphone or hands-free. Using the phone on speaker mode. Texting rather than talking. Keeping the phone a distance from the body as recommended in your phone's user manual. Reduce your exposure time by keeping voice calls short. Avoiding using your phone in poor signal areas such as lifts and moving vehicles. You can reduce your exposure from cordless phones by using speaker mode, limiting the length of the call, keeping your distance from the cordless phone base unit, using a wide landline phone. And for other wireless devices it says, You can reduce your exposure from these devices by keeping them at a distance. For example, placing a wireless router away from where people spend time and reducing the amount of time you use them. Let's protect children from wireless radiation until long-term exposure is proven harmless. Follow Apanza's advice to reduce children's exposure at home and at school and educate children on how to use wireless technology safely. For more facts and scientific evidence, visit wifiinschoolsaustralia.org.